All right, tonight we are going to start a new Bible study series, a complete look into Romans. Um, and I know everybody has uh, at least probably heard a scripture out of Romans before, so we're all experts on Romans. But um, I'm going to, to show you a few things in the, in the overview tonight as we get started that will make, if you've ever read the book of Romans, it's kind of sometimes can be confusing. It's a lot of um, twists and turns in his conversation, and it doesn't seem to sometimes make sense. I don't know if you've ever thought that, you know, read that scripture 10 times and it still don't quite click. Well, I think I'm going to be able to help you out with that. And I believe that through this Bible study, we're going to be able to um, see clearly the book of Romans um, in, in a way that it, it should open up into our understanding a lot better. So let's look at, um, first of all, uh, when, we, when we look at the book of Romans, it'd be interesting to know a few things about it. So, where most everybody says that it is a, um, uh, th it is commonly accepted that this is an epistle that describes the salvation of Christ, they're wrong. Um, it is not that. It does not follow that. But we are going to look at the foundation of the entirety of this whole picture. First being, uh, the book of Romans was written roughly, in case you care, in roughly between 51 and 58 A.D., or, yeah, A.D., that's in our common era. And uh, so that's, it was written about then. This was uh, sometime uh, after the death of Christ. Most of, a lot of the apostles were in, up in age at this time. Uh, Paul being uh, not, not too young of a man when all that got started, but not an old man either. Uh, but you see that things had gone on. So here is, here is at 50 AD, he writes this book, and he is trying to write to a particular group of people for a very specific reason. If you notice in chapter number 1, he addresses it to all, they, all that being at Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. So when Paul is sitting back, let me back up and let, let's, let's look at who Paul is. Let me get that, let's get that behind. Let's look at the history of Paul. Acts chapter 7, we see that there are, as a young man, is a disciple, that he is a stone. The Bible says that he preached the gospel and there were some people that didn't appreciate it. And they stoned the apostle, Stephen, and as they stoned Stephen, the Bible says that Paul was standing there, and this is the first mention of him in the Scripture, but Paul was standing there and he was uh, 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 giving, I forget how the Bible refers to it, but he was agreeing with the death of uh, stoning of, of Stephen. And he didn't, I don't know that the Scripture tells us he threw any stones, but they laid the coats at his feet, and he watched them while somebody else stoned them. And as, as they stoned Stephen, after preaching the word, that's where it seemed to enthuse Paul, or at that time named Saul, into getting excited about uh, the, the, the kingdom of God and the work of God as he saw it. Saul having been raised up, we can see this in, um, excuse me, whenever someone else don't type all this stuff up for me, I have to come up with my own. Whenever, uh, whenever Saul was, he said, I... Um, Forgive me, I can't read without these things sometimes. Um, what was that chapter and verse about that? Galatians. Not there. Now, I know I printed that. Okay. He sat at the feet of Gamal. And I'm sorry I don't have that written down. But um, the, Gamal was a... Oh, yeah, here we go. Acts chapter number 20. I know better than that. Somebody help me out here. Acts number, it's not 9, it's not 2, it's not Romans 1, it's not Romans 15. It's, I know it's in the book of Acts. Well, doggy, yeah, maybe I didn't print that. Acts 22 and 3. I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus of the city of uh, Cilicia, brought up to be in this city at the feet of Gamal, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law by the fathers, and was zealous toward God, and ye as ye all are this day. 
Now, this is important to understand. In order for us to understand Romans, we've got to understand Paul's background was strictly in the law. He did not just stumble around. He was not an illiterate man. He was a very learned man. He was a man of profession to be trained to be a teacher, trained to be a, a, uh, a speaker on an argument, a law giver, a law, whatever you want to call it. But uh, Gamal was a, 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 a high up man and this was his protege. And, and Saul was going to grow up to be his replacement, so to speak, or, or in his court. And as he took this, you have to under, the reason I say you have to understand that is because many of the things that Paul says in the book of Romans is based on this understanding that he has right here at the feet of Gamal. Uh, looking at it is like, you know, I don't know if he was necessarily his assistant, but consider that Gamal was a teacher and Paul was his, was his assistant. So as he learns these things, Paul is showing his qualifications in different places in the chapter in the scripture as to why he's going to be there. One of the other qualifications of Paul comes from Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he may, that he hath thereof, he might trust in the flesh, I more. In other words, on my own understanding and my own knowledge and my own schooling, I have more to lean on than other men. He says, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Paul is saying in this other place in, 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 um, in Philippians, his pedigree. The pedigree has everything to do with understanding Romans. So Paul is writing to Rome. He is most likely in Corinth when he writes to Rome. The church in Corinth had decided to, to bless the, the, the saints in Israel and Jerusalem. And he most likely wrote this letter while in Corinth before going to Jerusalem to give to the church the offering that was taken up for the saints. Now, it is, it is, that doesn't mean much except for to understand geographically where it was. It was an easy run from Corinth, which is a Grecian state, to zip over and get into Rome. And he sent this letter into Rome. This letter is not to a church that Paul started. As all of the other epistles, Paul started the churches and Paul managed them or he worked primarily as a founder of the churches. In this case, it is different. And it's very important to understand that. So we look at a history of, of Saul as he becomes the Apostle Paul. Saul is, is, is okay with the death of Stephen. Then he gets permission to begin to persecute the church. He persecutes the church everywhere he goes, in Jerusalem, around about Jerusalem. And we know according to the scripture that he gets letters from the priest to bind anyone that would call on the name of Jesus in Damascus. And he begins to go on what we have referred to as the road to Damascus. As he goes to Damascus, the Bible says the sun shined round about him. and It was brighter than the noonday. And he fell down and he was blinded. Now, the fact that he was blinded and, and it, 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 it uh, incapacitated him and brought him to a place that because of his understanding and his own abilities, it had gave him his motivation. But now all of a sudden, as blinded and incapable of doing anything, he was at a place where God could talk to him. As God began to talk to him, as he began to pray and began to seek God, the Lord shows us in the scripture that a man down the road, by the name of Ananias, came to him. And it says that the Lord spoke to Ananias and said, you need to go and pray for Paul. He is over such and such, and he is seeking, and God, he has seen in a vision that a man by the name of Ananias would pray for him, and he would receive his sight. And so Ananias goes to him, and he, he's blind, he's praying, and I, I don't know what the whole situation looked like. I'm just guessing. I, I, I wonder, you know, he's not from, he's from out of town. 
how did he get a place to stay? And all that, just, I have all kinds of weird questions when I read the Bible. It's just kind of... But the Bible says, and after he prays for him, he receives the Holy Ghost. He receives a sight. That happens. So now the Bible says this, Acts 9 and 20, And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues. Paul has a problem. And again, this is what so much of the book of Romans is about. Before before you enter into Romans. You've got to understand Paul's problem. It stems from the fact in Acts chapter 7 when he showed up. He was consenting to the death of Stephen. He persecuted the church. And he has got to deal with this problem. And I'm going to show you in the scripture that it wasn't just at Rome, but it's everywhere he went. He said, And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, and he is the Son of God, and that all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hitherto for the intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? And Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which were at Damascus, proving that this very Christ and that after many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. So he is in Damascus and he is making ends in ministering the goodness of Christ. He is preaching the oneness of Christ. He is preaching salvation through Christ. He is preaching deliverance through Christ. And as he is preaching this message, it upsets the Jews. Why? Because, first of all, they were willing to hear him because he was of their fundamental belief that Christ was not the answer. And so when they would hear him, he would begin to speak and then the, he would cause them to trip on their own understanding and he would try to get them to believe in Christ. You listen to people like, for instance, last night we had the debate. How many of you were going into the debate being Obama supporters would have been enthused about the way Obama spoke in the debate? You would have because he would have been what you expected to hear. But if Obama would have got out there in the debate and said, you know what, I woke up this morning and the light shined on me and I'm going to cut taxes, I'm going to remove restrictions, I'm going to, and all of a sudden just becomes very conservative and we're going to fix the debt problem, you would have been a little upset being an Obama supporter hearing him say that. Well, this is why the Jews were so upset at him. They were not as upset at all the other apostles, but because this was the man that had the authority, that had the wisdom and the scholarly teaching to, in, to, to destroy this, this upspringing religion. But instead of destroying it, you're joining it. It became an impossible situation in his ministry. He dealt with it everywhere he went. Let's look at Acts chapter 9 and verse 26 through 29. And when Saul came to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself with the disciples. Watch this. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. This is Paul's problem. Remember, he has a reason for writing this letter. You don't know why the letter's written yet, but he has a reason for writing the letter, and a large amount of what he writes is based on these things. All right? Verse 27. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how that he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly in Damascus in the name of Jesus. And while he was with, the com with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem, and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians by, but they went about to slay him. Let's look at Galatians. Chapter 1, verse 13. For ye have heard of my conversion, conversation, in times past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many of my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Now, for a much deeper understanding of some situations of Paul, study the book of Acts. We've gone through that book here in our Bible study series, but it wouldn't hurt for you to pick up the book of Acts and read it again because there are some great revelations about the things of Paul 
and his ministry that will seed into the dis discussion of Romans with some good understanding by knowing where he went and what he did. So let's go to the Church of Rome. Paul has been, again, he's traveling, he's preaching, and he is in, most likely in Corinth, and he wants to go to Rome. We know by the Word of God, if you read in the first part of the book of Romans, the Bible says, he says, um, for Acts, uh, Romans 1 and 8, he says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, for your faith that is spoken throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve in my spirit in the gospel of His Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you in my prayers, making request, if by any means now any at if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, to the end that you may be established. That is, I that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was led hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. Now, Paul is not saying, I'm writing to the church of Corinth or Ephesians, the church at Ephesus, or any of these other places where he had started. He is saying, I have wanted to come and visit you for a while now. You're already there. I would like to share with you and be comforted with you in the growth of the church. I want to sow a little something into what's going on. Um, and it, it's hard sometimes to always be the one doing the, the, the heavy lifting. But Paul is kind of saying, I kind of want to just come along and add to what's going on at Rome. I've been enthused about Rome. My prayers, my daily devotions have been, I, I have kept you in my prayers. I have made you part of my, my walk with God. And now I just really want to come. I've been trying. God's led me here. He's led me there. But I've been trying. But I really want to come and preach to you. How many of you know this never really happened? Because why? I, I won't get into the length of it right now. But if you read the scripture right there, this was the will of God, that he would go to Rome. However, the will of God also told him not to go to Jerusalem. But what did he do before he went to Rome after he left Corinth? He went to Jerusalem. He went to Rome, but not the way God wanted him to. Imagine how powerful it would have been had he went as a free man. But let me preach on, teach on. Okay, so here is the Apostle Paul. He goes, he's, he's, he's saying, I want to come see you. Now, this letter reminds me, and all I have is a partial. I don't have the, any, any, the old one. Well, I take it back. I probably do. But I, this is one I found, and I didn't, didn't spend a lot of time. I have way too many files on my computer to find stuff. Um, but this is what Paul is doing. I've done this. And I had talked to another, uh, somebody else about this, and they said, well, Brother Dunn, the reason you have caught what maybe so many other people haven't caught is because of your experience. And it doesn't change the Word of God, but it just opens up and shines a better light, I believe. All right, watch this. I, did a, I, did a, I wrote a similar letter to this at one time. It said, um, I'm writing to introduce myself. I'm an evangelist from Pineville, Louisiana. I've been on the field for two years now, part-time evangelizing and part-time as assistant pastor for the two previous years of that. I have held revivals from Key West to Redding, California, and all points in between. God has truly worked everywhere I've been. For, five to the, uh, for about five to the last seven months, I have been working mostly in home mission churches in California. And we have seen uh, these churches growing, some practically doubling in size, many receiving the Holy Ghost, and more receiving miracles testifying of Jesus' power in their lives. Although I'm telling you of the results of these services, I need to be the first to say that it is not me, it is simply God. That these, This being said, I am looking to make some acquaintances in your area. Since I do not know anyone around there to speak of, I would just like to send this note to informally say hi and that you would know who I am. If you would like to call me, etc., etc., etc. What is Paul writing to the Roman church? Paul is writing that same letter first. He is introducing himself. And then he is dealing with things about himself that they most likely have heard. So when you read the book of Romans, those strange things that sound weird when all of a sudden you recognize that he's saying, look, I want to come preach in your church. 
There's churches all over Rome. There's not just one church of Rome. There's churches all over Rome. Rome was a massive, massive city. And all over the city of Rome, there was churches and groups and home churches. And I don't know, maybe they had built buildings. I have no idea. But all of this was going on. Read the 16th chapter of the book of Romans. When you read the 16th chapter, well, let's just look at a few of them right now if you've got time. I don't know if you're in a hurry or not. But as you read in the 16th chapter of the book of Romans, Romans you'll find that there are many, many things mentioned here. Watch this. First of all, he sends a letter by the name of someone by the name of Phoebe, uh, a lady. And, uh, th but here's what she sa he says. He says, greet Priscilla and Aquila. They have a church in their home. They have done much for me, okay? It says, likewise, greet the church. That, oh, wait, that, that is in their house. That's them already, okay? And then, greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow servants who are of note among the apostles who were in Christ before me. So here Paul's not saying, he said, Paul's not saying I'm, I'm doing something new among you. He said these guys are already in Christ. So when we recognize as we go through the rest of the scriptures, remember this, that Brother Paul is not trying to teach a new gospel. He is trying to expound on what his ministry is so that when they bring him in, they know what they're getting. And they are bringing him in. i got chapter and verse on that in minutes. Just watch this. It said, salute your bane, our helper in Christ. Salute this other dude. Salute Hernonian. Uh, all, all these people are ba basically uh, uh, deacons, pastors, uh, uh, apostles of, of Christ that are at Rome with the gospel, with the Holy Ghost message, with salvation. In the kinsmen that he preached, that he talked about, these were Jews. They were not just Gentiles. These were not just a Gentile church. This was a Jewish church. This was a Greek church. This was a Roman church. This was a barbarian church. This was a church of slaves. This was a church of royalty. This was a church that encompassed many groups of people. And Paul addresses his ministry in each of these groups of people throughout the book of Romans. He doesn't address it just to Jews. He doesn't address it just to the Romans. He doesn't address it just to Gentiles. But there is also a large congregation of ministry in Romans, in the Roman church. And he addresses them specifically. And there are as many things that he speaks directly to the ministry in this book. So let's look a little bit more. Who started the church of Rome? Where did the church of Rome come from? I'm glad you asked. And Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 12. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, here's my other paper, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue? wherein we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Philgra and Pamphylia and Egypt and in parts of Libya around about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, do we hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God? And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying uh, to one to another, What meaneth this? Now, Okay, yes, the Bible says there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews. But everyone that gathered when the multitude came together were not Jews alone. They were Arabians and Cretes, and they were Romans. Uh, they were uh, proselytes. There were Jews. They were, um, let's see, there was one other one there. Um, 
Cretes and Arabians. Okay, yeah, that's it. That's all that's listed there. So there was many other nationalities there. There was some straight-up Gentiles that had not been converted. The proselytes were converted. But there was people that weren't converted there. So these people heard the preaching of the Word of God. What was the message that they heard? Well, if you take and you go from it to Acts chapter 2, and I won't read the Scriptures right now, but take the foundation message that they heard on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2, 16 through 34. 16 through 34 is the message that seeded the church of Rome. Because from that day forward, they obeyed the word of God, which said, Go ye into all the world, preach and teach the gospel to all men of every nation, beginning at Jerusalem. So, beginning at Jerusalem, the world began to get reached. And they took that gospel message from Jerusalem back to Rome, and they founded the Roman church, along with many, many, many other places. It wasn't just in Rome. Paul was not the only apostle. Peter was not the only one. There was many missionaries. There was many outreaches. They did not just focus on one or two. We just happened to be lucky because Paul had a guy that went around and wrote his autobiography. You know, if it wasn't for that, if it wasn't for Brother Luke, we wouldn't have a history of the church as we have. And because he walked around with Paul, he couldn't talk about somebody in Ethiopia because Paul didn't go to Ethiopia. He couldn't talk about somebody in, in South America. Paul didn't go to South America. But the whole world was evangelized in 30 years. They traveled all over the world. They made it up and through Russia. They made it into Asia. They went into China. Why did God keep Paul out of Asia? Because someone else was over there. It wasn't Paul's turn. Paul was not the only, even though he was the apostle by his own word, and he says it by my word. I am the apostle according to what God gave me to the Gentiles. However, we know that the first Gentile message was not preached by the apostle Paul, don't we? It was preached by Peter. And he was not the only messenger to the Gentiles because on the day of Pentecost, many of the Gentiles believed. How many? Wasn't there. I ain't old enough to be there. And God will tell us when we get to heaven if we remember to ask him. But that's how the Roman church got started. Paul writes a letter as a minister. Watch what he says in this scripture. At, uh, um, Romans chapter 15. I'm sorry. Um, okay, let me, let me back up on that in just a second. I'll get back to that in a second. I missed a point. It says, now, Romans 15 and 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren. Remember what he's doing. He's writing a letter to a church that he's wanting to go minister at. Okay? He's saying, and he's talked about all this other stuff, how he, his ministry fits right in with what they got going on, how he believes what they believe, how he overcomes his problem of being the guy that persecuted the church, so now he is the main preacher of the church. And he's overcoming all of this and he's wrapping it up, and this is what he's saying. He's done told them how he believes what they believe. He says, I myself am also persuaded of you, my brethren, that ye also are a full that are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge able to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. I have therefore... I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of anything of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me to make the Gentiles obedient by, the, by word and deed. Through many signs and wonders by power and the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about Lyceum I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Stop right there. I have not preached where other men have preached. Now, in all due respect, Peter preached at Damascus, and they had already been preaching there. 
Peter preached at Jerusalem. They already preached there. But you get the point. He was trying to outreach to people that did not have the gospel. That was his primary focus for everything that he had done up until this point. It was not just to sit in Jerusalem and discuss the gospel. That's what he's saying. So I, I never shy away from things that seem to be contradictory in the Bible because when you take it in context, it does level out. And the problem is, is if you always shy away from it and never face something that sounds to be a contradiction, then you always leave the door wide open to somebody to come in and destroy what lay good things you have laid. So he went about, it was his desire, it was his ministry, it was his focus that he was going to preach as far around as he could to people that he could that did not have the gospel. That was his focus. He worked with other people that had the gospel. He worked with other preachers. He, he, he was definitely part of it, but it wasn't the focus of his ministry. However, he says, but as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see and they shall... That's not the scripture I thought I was looking for. Okay, yeah, anyway. And they that have not heard shall understand. For which cause also I have been hindered for coming unto you. So these are the reasons why I haven't preached in your church before. And I haven't made it there before. Because there's people that needed to hear the gospel in towns that I was sent to. Where there was no church. And then he goes on to say this in verse 23. But now having more, no more place in these parts... And having a great desire these many years to come unto you. Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come unto you. And for I trust to see you in my journey. Now, he's saying, I'm still in the ministry that I've always been in. You see, Paul had a vision that beyond Rome, over in Spain, was a gospel that needed to be preached to an unpreached people. But I'm coming through Rome. I would love, when I travel back to Louisiana or when I go other places, I will usually call someone and go preach for them. Brother Jones came out here uh, for different purposes than what I thought. Then he told me. But he came out here and, hey, you're in the area? I would like to have you preach for me. Uh, a couple years ago, when I first came here, there was a, a tall man, I can't remember his name for nothing. He was in the area. Come preach for me. Why? Because you're in the area. Why not impart something that you have Add fertilizer to the seed that we're planting. We open up and that is a good thing. So Paul says, I'm coming right through Rome on my way to Spain to fulfill my ministry. And I would love to preach for you guys. I mean, I, it's like me. I would love to go preach at T.D. Jakes' church. I'd love to preach the gospel to them people. They need to hear it. No, but, but I'm just being funny. But yeah, you know, we've got to, we, you see where Paul's coming. Now watch what Paul does. This is an old time. This is the way it used to work. It don't work that way. As well, it does for some guys because they're bold and they, they're in it for the wrong reason. But uh, this is the way the old timers used to do it. Brother Shu, Brother uh, Duke, Brother, uh, old Brother Duke, blind as a bat, couldn't see anything. He'd pick up a phone, call somebody and say, send me a train ticket. I need to come preach for you. He'd go to the bus stop or train and there was the ticket right there ready for him to go. They'd know what time to pick him up, and he'd have his little suitcase, and they'd pick him up and take him to church, and he'd preach for him for several weeks. And while he's there, he'd God move on him to where he needed to go. And he'd call somebody else. He'd say, you know, I really feel like I need to head your way. Can you send me, send me a bus ticket? Get the bus. And that's, how they, that's the way it used to work. But, you know, of course, now they've got to have motor homes. And, but watch what Paul says. Watch the next word. And to be brought on my way thitherward by you. Hey, Bishop, really like to come preach for your congregation. I showed you all my qualifications. I really appreciate if you'd send somebody to give me a ride or send me the funds that it takes for me to get there. Phoebe's got the letter. You can leave it with her. How are we going to get you the money, Paul? I sent somebody with this letter. They'll get it back to me. It didn't describe all that, but just get your, let your brain work. It's not black and white in Scripture that he said that, but I'm telling you he said that. I'm telling you that's what was understood. All right? It says, uh, Be brought on my way through the word by you, if first I be somewhat filled with your company. Okay, so Paul is writing this book that we're going to really begin to get deep into starting next week, into conversations, into deep questions and study about 
the work of his ministry, about what he was doing and what he was coming to Rome to do. He was not going to just come and puff up the church. He was going to come and try to help the church. To give you an insight, he's unifying the church. Okay? In all of this discussion, it is about the unification of the Jews, the Greeks, the Romans, the, the barbarians, the, the ministry. Uh, one of the greatest things that I got out of this study that I've worked on and I'm still working on and the Lord is still revealing to me is how He desired to unify the actual ministry. Too many times our ministry is divided by things and not, not united by Christ. And from the chapter 12 unto the chapter 15, he is speaking strictly to the ministry. From the very beginnings, he's talking about himself. Then he begins to talk to the Jews. And then he begins to talk to the Gentiles. He talks to the Jews about the Gentiles. He talks to the Gentiles about the Jews. And he begins to do everything to unite the entirety of the body of the Church of Rome under one thing, Christ and Him crucified. There is no one that in the book of Romans was saved. He was not saying, I am coming there to have a great revival for thousands of people to get the Holy Ghost. He was saying, I'm coming there to drop upon you some things that God has given me as a minister of the Gentiles that will bring your church together and cause you to be more powerfully aware and secure in Christ. If we can get that in this church, in this society, in this religious, uh, the church, our religious world today. Guess what? There are churches we're not bound to in Christ because they don't preach Christ. They preach other things. But there are people that preach Christ, just like we preach Christ. But we're as divided from because of things. And it's not that the things are wrong. It's not that the things are right. It's that they are division because we're not focused on what we're supposed to be focused. So as we break down, we will be starting uh, next week on a few of the qualifications of Paul, and then we will be moving directly into the teaching of about how the Jews need to understand the Gentiles and how Paul is planning to bring them together into the worship of Jesus Christ and to the understanding of their own salvation. All right?